Yo, what's good, comic fam? We back. Yo, I'm feeling good this week because we have a packed show for the community. And I want to remind you, if you don't want to watch this on YouTube, but this is where the videos go first. You can also find at a later date, the full podcast on SoundCloud, Spotify, Stitcher, and iTunes. Bags and Boars number 74. We got the Golden Age Guru in the casa. We got Fire Guy Ryan. We got a massive show. There's an entire renaissance happening with graded comics, and we're going to get into it. But I have a complaint about comic book collecting, all right? This is a way more dangerous hobby than some might think. I have been hurt so many damn times because of comic books that the first bit today is about comic book health insurance. And the fact that it doesn't exist is a problem. And I'm being kind of funny here, but low-key, I have an elbow injury— because I slapped it on my freaking press and burned myself a little bit. Is that bit. what that is? You've been yeah. picking at it and itching it for days, and I'm like, it what the hell? It will heal, dude. Okay, I didn't realize it was comic book related. I thought you just had dry skin. I have a cut on my finger because I was doing something with a box cutter, and I rubbed it up against a like piece of cardboard, and it cut my finger. Speaking of which, I got a brand new box cutter. Crap was so sharp. First time opening up a AOK, you know, eBay purchase, whatever it was, slice my damn finger open. Like the shards of Narsil. Still sharp. It is terrible. And I mentioned to you, Jeff, I know you could relate, but I keep hurting myself. I, like, I got you on the phone. I'm like, dude, I'm so freaking frustrated, man. I'm like, I'm like just damaged. You know, I'm not 100%. This game, this comic hobby is debilitating sometimes. Well, it's because it's an exhausting hobby. I'll be honest with you. Like, usually when I have some type of accident or mistake, whether I accidentally have damaged a comic in the past or have damaged myself, it's because I've been working on them for so long all day or I'm tired or I just, I just have a lapse in judgment or memory at the time and I either, like, cardboard slice my finger, which is the worst because it feels like it goes forever and it feels deep and you know when you did it, okay? Um, I've never really burned myself on my press um, so that's new, but you know, cutting yourself with those mylars because those will jack up your cuticles quicker than you can even, you know, before you can blink an eye, it's happening. So again, I've said this before and I'll say it again. Uh, when you go looking through boxes at conventions and you see nothing but mylars, really examine the top. You're going to see a lot of dry blood on there because people are bleeders. All right. So there's been plenty of that moving boxes along, man, that big collection we got. Dude, my back was jacked for a good two plus months, two and a half. I finally addressed it, had to do PT for a little bit, and um, now I'm back. And uh, But boy, those boxes don't get lighter. I mean, let me tell you, as you get older, those boxes stay the same weight, but they feel heavier. Pro tip, just get short boxes. Don't mess. Don't worry about long boxes. Just get two short boxes to make up one. You'll be, you'll be happier. You might have to move one more thing, but moving two small things is much better than moving one giant heavy long box. I used to believe that. I did. So it's a lot more trips. Don't get me wrong. When you're loading in and out for a convention, it's more trips, which is one thing, fine. Um, but when you're storing a bunch of, like, uh, trying to uh, store in, t in a space a bunch of comics, you want to go long because the shelving, you'll maximize your space because otherwise you have back-to-back -back shorts and you have to remove a short to get to the back short. And I've realized that, yes, it's good for some purposes the short boxes I really did I was like I'm gonna be smarter I'm going short so I went short and now I got all these shorts and I want all these longs because now I have a big collection that I need to store and storing it in longer boxes is just a better option if you're gonna be constantly moving in and out with boxes I recommend short granted it's a lot more trips but it's, it's worth it so my, my two cents growing up on five acres with a like separate location where all the comics, all the comics that my dad acquired, um, you know, they were separate from the house. We had like a guest house and it was just packed with boxes. And whenever we did shows, whenever we were working on them, he would tell me, hey, Tom, I need you to go move these from A to B, from B to C, like all the damn time. Oh, we have family coming up and they're going to stay here for two weeks in the guest house. Yeah, we got to move all those comics to the barn. Oh, snap. We're going to do a go, uh, go do a comic show. Co Tom. Go and grab all those books from the barn and move them to the main house because tomorrow morning at 4 a.m. we got to load the damn car. So 
I was used to moving these and I was way more scrawny. I'm talking like 13 year old, 12 year old Tom, okay? And these boxes were very thin. And it's nice because they're light, they still protect the comics, but you know what I'm talking about. Those handles, when you're lifting up a heavy thing, you know, heavy long box, they, if they're thin, if they're plastic, you know, some of these short boxes were plastic, they dig into your monos like nobody's business. And I just had this. Uh, just disdain for comics in general just because of the fatigue and the injuries that I would face as a young adult. Yeah, and I, those handles did suck. They do. You kind of always want the double layer handle, you know, you got, make sure you've got the both, you got the outside and you got the flap in. And, you, and then when you would pull them out, you would rip it sometimes. And then you're like, okay, you have to get tape. You got to resecure because you're not going to move them all to another box. You're going to repair the box because that's what we did back in the day. We didn't buy new boxes. We repaired the existing and we dealt with it. And that stupid tape stayed there until you sold that box entirely or finally something happened where it got eventually destroyed. What is your worst comic book injury? Let us know in the comments section below. We're talking now about something brand new that has just started. And I was actually preview to one of my homies actually getting one of these done months ago. It actually happened at Megacon. Shout out Davis Ryder. He had this idea. He had this Darkwing Duck 9.8 David Nakayama variant. Gorgeous Spawn 1 homage. And he wanted to get a remark done. And he thought, I can give David a raw copy and have him remark it. Or maybe I just take this 9.8 slab already encased and have them just draw something on the slab. And then Jeff, you sent us a message about a book that looks so damn cool. That's about to sell on, was it heritage? Yeah. Heritage has this book for auction. It's a TMNT number one, first print. And I believe it was a nine, two. And what happened is it's a yellow label. So it's a signature series. It's been signed already, but there was a remark by Kevin Eastman on the front of the cover excuse me, on the front of the slab. On the plastic. On the plastic. Not the comic. Not the comic. So I have seen people signing slabs, okay, but I haven't really seen remarks. So when I saw this one, it was so over the top, and it just really popped, and it actually looked pretty freaking cool. Didn't really take away, I don't think. I mean, there's going to be traditionalists always who are always going to be like, oh, you're defacing something so classic. And to be honest, I'm not a huge fan of that cover anyway. I've never liked that style, so I don't really give a damn. This actually looks better to me um, with it being the contrast of the kind of black and white cover to the color of the front layer of this plastic. Anyways, it's on auction. It's at 16500 or so right now with like, I think it goes off on June 22nd, so still a lot of time. It's a pretty strong number already. What do you think, Ryan? Like, as someone who is probably more likely to pay for collectibles from artists and creators, writers, getting things signed, getting things remarked before going like, you know, head first into a nine, eight expensive comic book. How do you feel about getting a piece of art done on a piece of plastic rather than the actual collectible itself? I mean, speaking about that, that turtles one specifically, like, the, like Jeff was talking, the colors really pop. And there's a cool effect, too, because it's almost like a 3D sort of version of the remark because it's on the, the, the case, which is removed from the actual comic itself on the inside. So there's a little bit of depth to it. I think that's pretty cool. I have seen people complain that, you know, that's going to wear off over time and it's going to end up looking kind of gross, you know, the further down the, down the road you go. But the book itself on the inside, everything is still preserved and intact on the inside. So, like, absolute worst case scenario, you've still got a yellow label 9-8 TMNT number one on the inside. That was definitely something that I would uh, put a word of caution out there. There is a particular way you have to draw on these slabs. It has to be done in layers. It has to be done with the right type of ink because I've seen this done more than once and it bleeds like a mofo and that ink does not dry. And if you've ever dealt with a remark that wasn't drying, especially at a convention, yo, you have not like dealt with the woes of conventions and how bad it can get. There were times where I had a handful of remarks that I just paid for. And there was a point, shout out Michael Calera, because he had this idea. He was actually doing, he's our editor, by the way, of Crashdown and um, head of massive publishing, whatnot publishing. And he was doing a bunch of remarks on, at the time it was at Emerald City Comic Con. And they released this ash can with the Space Needle Jim Mafood cover. 
it, it's a gorgeous cover. I love it. And I had a bunch. And I'm like, yo, Michael, I'll pay. I want you to do a bunch of remarks. We're going to do giveaways. We're in Seattle. This is my town. So I was going to have a good time with it. And there was a person next to me, a, a fan of Michael and a fan of the show. And he says, you know what would be really cool to do? You should put some red on that black and white sketch. And Michael's like, oh, I don't have a red. And this mem- this homie said, oh, I have a red marker you can use. And the first thing I thought of was, I haven't cleared that red marker. If Michael hasn't cleared that red, red marker and I haven't, we're taking a risk right now because what if he pulls out something that is just going to be terrible as far as the drying process goes? And sure enough, yo, I was walking out that convention holding two comics like this. I have my partner with me. She's holding two comics like this. And it, it, was, it was a mess. And that entire weekend, three days at Emerald City in my hotel, I had these like propped up on plants and like random chairs. I'm, I'm taking out that hair dryer that they have in the bathroom and I'm, I'm hitting them. Every once in a while when no one was streaming, I'm just like, you know, hitting them with that hot air and they all got ruined. None of them stuck. And I still remember that person. He's a homie, but yo, that was a bad move and I should have stuck with my gut. Don't add any variables to an already pricey situation. Yeah, I mean, you got to kind of take in consideration um, what you're applying it to, right? If you're applying it to plastic, obviously plastic is not absorbent whatsoever, so it's going to have to dry, but it's also going to lend to scrapes, right? If something scraped across the top, it'll scrape right off. If something like brushed against the top of a comic, it's not going to just peel away, and obviously paper absorbs better, so I get that. Um, I do feel the colors become more rich with the type of markers that were used, especially on a clear plastic like that. But they do also um, resonate on a comic as well. But then you got to worry about potential probably bleed through, I would assume. I don't know. I haven't quite. It happens. You know, so I get it. I mean, there's pros and cons, so choose wisely. You must choose. But choose wisely. Will they slab the slab? They better this, not. This TMNT remark one with the crazy Kevin Eastman on it. You Don't think give them ideas, You can Ryan. submit that back to CGC and say, just give me some kind of even bigger plastic container that will keep going. You just get like down the down the rabbit hole Inception style and just remark and remark and remark and remark. Well, what I can say is that there is a con to this, which is that it definitely puts the art at risk. And if you ever accidentally crack that case, you're SOL, right? Like you're going to get a, re- you're going to redo the case, you know, you're going to lose that, that piece of art on it. So you, it's just, it's a layer of like insurance that really you have when you're putting artwork behind the slab at the very least in the event that something happens to the slab, let alone rubs up against it. You know, most of the time in regards to slabs for me, I don't value the slab. I value the grade of the slab. And the contents on the inside, if there's a scratch on it, whatever, it's like $12, $15, or I mean, who knows their pricing, they're changing it every freaking week, it seems like. But with that said, it's, uh, I don't look at that as a $15 charge as much when there's a freaking Kevin Eastman sign and remark turtle on the front of it. Yeah, I mean, look, it's a separate piece of layered art. So, um, like, again, those those, uh, I don't know if it's an old magazine case or new one. We're going to find out because um, we're going to be sh- unboxing the new CGC cases. So we'll see uh, what those look like. But um, those cases are generally flimsy. Um, if you crack that case along the art side, you're kind of screwed. Um, if you end up popping that case very carefully, you have a separate piece of art. You can put it up. You can put it against another comic book if you want and just kind of clamshell them together. I mean, it's just... You could do something with it. You do have that flexibility, but you got to be careful about that plastic break-in. Back when I was doing my aggressive Mignola collecting, I didn't just have a 9-8 copy of Next Men 21. I had a 9-8 signed copy of Next Men 21. And I looked at those and thought, I do want a remarked copy. And Mignola doesn't really do remarks. But at the time, I was deciding, I need to get another 9.8 because I want them all. I want one of each. And I know that's excessive. You know, and I understand if members don't agree with me there, they'd probably be fine with a nine eight with all the works done with it. But I gotta say, as someone who was like really trying to piece together the best collection I could, having artwork that's done after the fact is just such a different collectible that it definitely pulled away from me wanting to like sacrifice another copy in my collection. I just wanted to get more. So seeing this extra layer of what you can do with a slab 
it kind of excites me because for those who don't want to have their comic book tainted in any way, and there's a lot of people in the community. I mean, this has been a point of discussion for years, decades now, you know, whether a signature in Sharpie is actually uh, causing some type of added part to the comic that should devalue it. But we're in a time now where some signatures raise the value when others don't. And it's an interesting phenomenon. The whole signature thing of one's devaluing and one's raising value, that's a whole nother topic. But I'd love to hear your opinions on this one. Remarks on slabs. What's your opinion on them? Please let us know down below. I mean, if you're already like scrolling down there to get to the comment section, you, you can't just scroll past the thumbs up and not hit it. You got to hit that. And you should probably hit subscribe while you're down in that general neighborhood, too, because we're we're back. We're back, baby. The Bags and Boards podcast. We're doing it every two weeks now. So stay tuned. And we all went and saw the new Spider-Man movie that is being just uplifted like no other movie I've seen that's come out in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, even the DCU, in probably two years, safe to say. And the words that it's the best Spider-Man movie of all time has been floating around. And I brought that question to the table today because we've all seen it. And I'm just going to start this off by saying I do not think that this is my favorite Spider-Man movie of all time. And the main reason for that is that it was an animation and I put the live action adaptations in a completely different camp, personally. Um, there's a lot of great DC animated movies that most people have never seen. I buy those on Blu-ray regularly. They're amazing. There's a lot of like JLA Dark and Constantine stuff that I would recommend. What are your opinions and let's kick it over to Ryan first. Is this most recent Spider-Man movie your favorite that has come out? And I want to know why. We should probably say spoiler warning. I mean, by the time this podcast hits, you, you've had at least a week or two now, I think, to, to get to the theater and check this out. But if you're like me and you haven't yet, skip this section because we're going to get into Across the Spider-Verse, which I think is my favorite Spider-Man movie I would I would agree with you on the on the delineation between live action and animation if it weren't for the fact that we got confirmation in this movie that it is in continuity with the MCU Earth 19999 whatever number it actually is. There's too many nines there. Got to get that under control. But I think the animation specifically of this movie sets it apart from any other animated movie I think I've ever seen, but especially the DC animated movies which are fine. They're certainly better than the live-action DC movies in a lot of cases, but I think the animation in those feels very cheap and mass-produced. So I'm not, I'm not the biggest fan of the DC animated stuff. What about you, Jeff? Is this the best Spider-Man movie of all time? And I'm going to add one more thing to it. If you say no, I want to know at least what comes to mind as your favorite, if not like your top two, just to kind of get some perspective of where you're coming from. Yeah, I mean, I did not find this to be my favorite Spider-Man movie of all time. I'll be honest, the first one, which was five years ago now, so this built a lot of anticipation um, for a second one to come out. That's a long time to have had us waiting after such a great first uh, first movie. So, But I love the live action better. So really the last couple Spider-Mans for me have been outstanding. And don't get me wrong, I don't want that to take away anything from this movie because this movie was really, really good. Um, so for me, um, I like the live action better, but this was pretty great to me. And I'm excited to see part two because it, it left me wanting more, which is always a great sign of a movie that already ran. I don't know, what was it, a two-hour movie, I'm assuming? Um, so again, um, no, it's not. Um, I love the live action, but damn, it's good. And that first one, I think that first one was... At that time, maybe my favorite Spider-Man movie at that time. But since then, with the live actions and the storylines, I think I've changed now to like those better. So which specific live action? I want to I dig a little I'm deeper. I'm trying to remember the last two. It was Homecoming and... Far was, From Home. And Far From Home. Homecoming, Far From Home, and No Way Home was the no multiverse one. Boy, I mean, they're all pretty fantastic. So, But really, the last two especially when you had all the Spider-Mans show up that were in the live action. Are you kidding me? That, that moment and scene, pff, I know we had a lot of Spider-Mans in this movie. Don't get me wrong, but I wasn't emotionally connected to any of them really. So having that emotional connection with the live action ones and then them all coming together, that was very powerful for me. I found it 
very successful that they were able to introduce so many characters, new Spider-Man, but also villains too. The spot, you know, like what a strange pick for a character that was so underrated. They did the spot right during the animated show, like the the OG animated uh, Spider-Man show. And a lot of people don't even realize that he like was introduced to most people through that cartoon, um, like Saturday morning vibes, right? And him being like, I would say the main antagonist of this movie, but it's also not really correct to say that because this movie was more of a focus on Miles and Gwen dealing with Spidey 2099 almost on screen more and dealing with the problems there than with the spot, especially because we knew going into this, the spot was going to carry over to the third part of this trilogy. And by the end of the movie, we see why, you know, spots becoming a very dangerous foe all throughout this and it's setting us up for the sequel. Um, but all the different spider characters that were introduced, I got to say, seeing Ben Riley on the screen, like low key MVP of the movie next to probably spider punk. I mean, dynamite performance. And I think that there are way more, opportunities long term with the spider verse that they'll be able to do something uh that i think is going to directly affect comic collecting investing um, on a larger scale i've mentioned this on the show multiple times this year because we just went through in the last five years a ramp up period in comics that we've never seen to a peak that has never happened in history um and then a adjustment period that's been steep but still far above where comics used to be prior to 2019, right? And in retrospect, if I were to have just pooled all my money that I've been specking, using to spec on comics, purchasing, et cetera, maybe even like collections that I purchased with particular comics in mind over others, I would go Spider-Man 100%. Silver Age Spidey, Romita, Ditko, Stanley Goodness, you know? I would be investing in AF-15s. I remember having conversations with you on the con floor back in like 2019, 2018, and you saying, these prices don't make sense. I think Spidey is really where it's at. And I still remember that because I was kicking myself, not participating in acquiring more Spider-Man. After seeing this movie, that's really what I was feeling the whole time. Is like long-term, I think there's more potential in the Spider-Verse than possibly even the MCU at large. DC, prior to James Gunn, I would say the same thing. But now that James Gunn is over there, you know, he, he gets a fresh slate and he may shake some stuff up. I've actually been selling runs of comics on whatnot on your shows once a week. And every now and then I'll bring a run of a Spider-Man book, like a whole story arc from the current run by Zeb Wells, which is not that great, if I'm being 100% honest. doesn't matter. It still sells way better than anything else I bring, even if I say, I really like this run. It's my favorite thing. I think you guys should really read this independent book. Nobody cares. But if I bring a six-issue run of a subpar Spider-Man run, People go bonkers over it. It's 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 true. I think there's a, a genuine appetite for Spider-Man across all eras and quality levels even. Well, when you think about Spider-Boy coming out recently, really shaking up the collector's market, I saw a lot of disdain for Spider-Boy. People kind of getting upset that there is so much spec and FOMO being experienced by the community, uplifting a brand new character that no one really knows about, that low-key seems a little derivative of others. But when it comes down to it, a brand new Spidey character, and then seeing what was just on the screen over this last week with this brand new Spider-Man movie, it makes so much sense. There is so much potential in every character, especially because they're sourcing brand new characters from like the last decade. Everything is fair game. Even relatively minor Spider characters in this movie made a mark, like the the T Rex and the the web slinging uh, Western you know cowboy Spider Man character. Like there's a, there's a lot of minor ones that even made a pretty big impact. So yeah, I think you're definitely right in the fact that anything goes, anything feels like it's fair game as far as uh, Spider-Man spec. Yeah, I mean, look, if we're just talking about characters that have uh, transcended just the hobby into no-brain collectible, uh, like just the character you is a no-brainer, it's always been Spider-Man. Spider-Man and Batman. Um, those are the two hottest. They just are. And it's always been like that. For as long as I've known in this hobby, and I've been in this hobby, I've been in this hobby a long time. So if you're ever going to put your money into characters, make it those two, um, because obviously it's a wider base of people who are interested in that. So any Spider-Man at this point, sure, you can go and speculate. Don't go nuts, guys. Sometimes just stay with the tried and true. Nothing wrong with that, 
All right, play it safe. Grab a major book from a, of a major character. Keep it simple. If you want to overanalyze and um, take that gamble, okay, then take the gamble. Anybody who wants to judge you on it as, as a gamble, then they can go take a long walk off a short cliff and, you know, disappear from this collectible if you ask me. Let everybody do their own thing, by the way. Leave the hell of everybody else alone. Let's enjoy this hobby all together. I want to know what you think in the comment section below, comic fam. What do you think about Across the Spider-Verse? I will mention this caveat. Don't go nuts right now. The movie just came out. The books are going to trend, yes. You may see them popping. You may see people start to post. But remember, these are mostly modern characters. There's a lot of copies up for grabs. And there's about a year before we're going to see the third movie. Maybe take your time. Wait a little bit. Have some patience. Put some eBay save search listings on your app so you can be notified. Because there's going to be a point over the next, I suspect, three to six months that the majority of these books are going to be more attainable. Now let's welcome to the show a couple of homies. Selling Superman. Jeff, you were in the documentary. We chatted about it last week, but we have some friends who have not only been part of this process, they were the first to sell some of the books. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome the powerful Rage Theo and Phil, the one true nerd king to the show. How you feeling? My brothers. How are you, sir? How are you? Thank you for having us. I appreciate it. It's an honor, man. Really excited to be here. Thank you. I'm so excited to dive into this. What was it like seeing this collection in person? So the Fantastic Collection is um, a collection that really started back in the 1930s and can span all the way up to as recently as 2003. This was collected by a father of two young boys that really honestly had a lot of things going on in his life that he, he, he didn't want to admit. And one of those things was a very high addiction to collecting in general, right? He collected many different things, but comics, man, he was all over it. And we're talking millions of collectibles in general. And these comics span so many different years. And when he passed away, this was inherited then to his son, Darren. This was a big a big, a big moment in his life because Darren and his father had a very tumultuous relationship and these comics drove a huge wedge into his family. The family was literally torn apart by this man's collecting and this collection. So inheriting it was a monumental moment of what do we do? You know, what, how do I feel about this collection? What are, what can, what can I do in the community with these books for other people? There was a lot of choices that had to come out from this. Darren really started to talk about it with a good friend of his that is in filmmaking, Adam. And they decided to make a documentary because a lot of things about comics we don't talk about aren't just the stories in the pages in the book. It's also the stories of the people that are affected by those characters and by those stories and by these things. And that's where the documentary Selling Superman really comes from. And this collection really came to our, um, our came into our focus at Comics and Chaos. So Theo and I reached out. We started a conversation. And boy, oh boy, it's been nothing but an amazing ride. We were excited to find out that you were heading down there to be some of the first members to help sell and move these books. And we had just got done talking about the collection and the Finding Superman documentary over the last podcast. And that weekend when we debuted the podcast, we're watching you guys on Instagram, handling the book, <laughs> selling the books for the first time. What was it like upon entry, seeing this massive collection, seeing the vault, seeing the goods? This was a massive collection. Um, this is the first time I've ever been flown out somewhere to do a, a sale, let alone the first time I've ever taken on uh, someone's collection to consign. So it was, it was a learning process for me. And I could tell you guys right off the rip, this collection not only is massive, not only spans from the golden age to the modern age, but it is completely unorganized. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, you'd literally get a short box out from a vault or from the shipping container, and you'd be going through, there'd be golden age, there'd be DC, there'd be Marvel, there'd be some wildcats, and you're just like, Okay, where do we start? How do how do we get this going right now? So uh, the the process of organizing for this sale, I don't want to say it was a headache, but it was definitely a challenge. 
it was definitely a challenge. I didn't know what we were walking into. I had an idea, um, but getting ready for the actual sale, I think was the hardest part for myself and for Phil. Yeah, I can't imagine like having to go through that stuff um, for the first time to pick out books to put for sale in such an unorganized environment. Because, I mean, I went and saw the collection. I looked through every single box. I know exactly what you're talking about. And when you say containers, it's because they were stored in three shipping containers. So Selling Superman is the documentary. Fantast is the name of the collection. And Darren is one of the sons who's been taking the responsibility to really manage uh, the, I guess, the books going out and the organization of it. But to have to step in there as an outsider to sell these books and go through that, I mean, that's a huge undertaking. And you guys are just getting started, right? Because there's going to be more to come. Yes, oh, yeah. This, this, was, is... this was our first of many yeah. sales. The one thing I do respect about Darren, instead of just selling his dad's collection and kind of taking the money and walking away from the hobby, he's actually reinvesting it back into the hobby. He's picking up Golden Age Grails, high-grade books that he's always wanted as a kid. So I respect that. I respect that a lot. And the best thing about this hobby is it's a hobby that can pay for itself because that was the main thing about this collection is the fact that it never got to be enjoyed, man. He, his dad would go just buy the books and they just go in a box. His dad didn't open them, didn't go. He, there wasn't like his own reader copies. His dad just saw books, bought books, put books in box. And then when he passed away roughly two years ago, boxes opened. That was it. That's the story of every single one of those comics in that box. Dad saw, dad bought, dad boxed, dad passed away, and nobody saw until that time. And the multiples of keys and just iconic books that they have in this collection, I've never seen anything like it. In the middle of a show, I remember a few customers, they were like, oh, do you have any more Ghost Rider 1s? Because we had sold two copies. And Darren in the background was like, one second, one second. He comes back, it's like, boom, short box. Whole thing's full of Ghost Rider ones. He's like, ah, here, take these ten. We could, we could sell those. I got, I got another ten at CGC. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> there was ten giant size X Men in there, and eight of them came back as a nine point eight from CGC. He goes, the dog in the entire set was an eight point five. I feel like you guys kind of breezed past this a few minutes ago, but you mentioned these were in shipping containers and like a vault. Oh, exactly what you would imagine. Just gigantic shipping containers climate controlled too with indoor lighting built-in customizable shelves you go in there there's literally two walls and they're just stacked with short boxes all the way down darren's not somebody that just inherited a bunch of comics darren uh has his own careers that he built for himself before this collection became his. Darren's got a number of different financial advisory businesses. He's got a technology business. Darren knows what to do and how to take care of things. So when this collection came to him, he put it in the exact right places. And these are three large shipping containers that you see on freaking freighters going across the ocean, bringing things back and forth. They aren't like little just piddly dink kinds of like, oh, I, I, I see the little pods dropped on somebody's driveway for moving. No, 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 no. These are shipping containers. And the safe, I mean, I think Theo and I could have both sat in that safe with room. <laughs> you know, it wasn't just like, oh, and if you know me, I'm a big dude, right? So, I mean, it's, it's a safe safe. Um, and every single one of those shipping containers was individually safe locked as well with special coded dude it was like something on a mission impossible holding comic books definitely some good security in there yeah let's get specific i want to know books that you got to see got to hold what were the most exciting ones you mentioned giant size i imagine that's one of the least exciting things you saw to start off um i got to hold a 7.0 superman number one um i think that's like about a three 2.5 million dollar book give or take a few hundred thousand, you know, but uh, that's the first time I've ever held one, let alone a 7.0. Um, I think I held, what was it? Two or three AF-15s, all 5.0 or higher. I think at one point he let me take a look at four fantastic four number ones, the lowest grade being a 4.0, all the way up to, I think like a six and a seven. I'm going back through my phone right now because I want to be specific. 
I was taking selfies with each of these books. I'm not going to lie. It was one of those kinds of moments where you see like, you know, a star on the streets. You're like, oh, 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 I get a picture. It's one of those kinds of moments where I've got Superman one. I've got the amazing Spider-Man's Theo's talking about as well. Um, I'm a Star Wars nerd, so I've got a 9.8, you know, newsstand Star Wars right next to the uh, Clone Wars one. So those are two big grails for me, both just sitting there again in a 9.8. It's freaking just ridiculous, stupid, amazing fantasies. And as you kind of look through, you can just see the number of slabs that are in this collection, <laughs> right? I mean, you're, and those are baseball cards. And those aren't just like any baseball cards. Those are Babe Ruth's. Those are Mickey Mantles. Those are copious amounts of collectibles, guys, that are 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 ridiculous to have one in any person's collection. And you're talking about like a safe load. Speaking of grading, is it correct that there's upwards of 5,000 of these books on their way to Sarasota as we speak? There are at least 5,000 on their way down right now. And there are at least 5,000 coming back these next week or two from there. there. There's that much in cycle. And I think it was like, what, $150,000, $140,000 CGC bill? That has to be on the low end. That has to be for that many books. It's ridiculous. Just whole rows and shelves of a shipping container just from one side to the other. Slab Comics. Amazing. I got to hear what the community thinks in the comment section below <laughs> about this collection. You can follow Rage over on Instagram, Rage Theo. You can follow Phil at One True Nerd King and their YouTube channel, Comics and Chaos. I'm going to ask one last question, guys, and we'll make it real quick for you. If you had that Superman graded comic, would you sell it? It's a, it's a hard question, Tom. Yeah, no, no, you got to just answer that, it. That's yeah. a hard question. If I had the Superman one in a 7.0 with my current situation, having three younger kids, I think I would sell it. It would probably make me cry to do so, but I know the good it would do for myself and my family and my collecting career. So as much as I wouldn't want to, yes, I would sell it. No, I'd keep it. I'd keep it. That's just like, it's the oh. second highest on census, man. It would be cool enough to be handed down to my daughter. It would go from, you know, three to six or seven, and then she can make that decision. I would, I would feel comfortable with that. But for me, I'd keep it. All right, Phil, real quick. It's third highest graded now. Oh, is that what changing? a jerk. Would you sell it now? Third highest? Third still, man. You're talking about a guy that's never gotten a medal for anything in his life. You know, <laughs> I take a third place. I'm okay with that. I mean, it's a big book, you know, like, like you said, you got to sell something to up the security for that type of a book to be in your house, man. Like, Stop being logical. You're really upsetting me right now. I need to live not in reality at the moment and just 100% in my imagination and in my pretend little freaking world, I keep the book. Okay, touche. Gentlemen, thank you for being on the show today. We'll see you again soon. Thank you so much, man. Thank you, man. So we get a message from Jeff weeks ago and says, hey, I have something that I want to bring to the table, but I don't want to show you. Do you want to tell us why we're here? Yes, this is one of those IG TikTok moments where you're just scrolling and something captures your eye and you're like, oh, and it was relatable to comics, okay? And this might actually be a good Gem Mint topic, to be honest, because it's kind of statue related. It's your boy Gem Mint. That guy. And I'm looking at these images, so I didn't want to show you guys ahead of time because they're a little disturbing. So I want you to take a look at it now. Okay. It All just right. says surprise folder right here on yeah. our Google Drive. We have no idea what's in here. Uh, Jeff is being super secretive, so this better be good. Do I go photo or video first? Go with the um, IG video first. All right. Authentic reaction. Let's see what right. Jeff brought to the table. Okay. All right. So, <laughs> okay. So what we're looking at uh, is oh. someone assembling a statue, a doll of Harley Quinn, Margot Robbie, and the sculptor, the, the person putting this together is literally putting teeth in the mouth of the doll. And it is so realistic. Like, kudos. This is a very talented individual. But, wow, it is kind of creepy. I, I don't know how I feel about this. And knowing that uh, all of these pieces are do it again. being there, removed, et cetera. There's other characters. Oh, just, God, yeah. <laughs> oh my, that That's like real, real skin. That's what I'm saying. They're silicone. I didn't even know this was a thing. Like, I'm when you think statues, what do you think? Like, just some type of ceramic yeah. or plastic? 
right? So I'm just scrolling and I see this. And I was like, whoa, okay. And they're so lifelike. So I want to mm. ask you guys, is it ever too realistic? Yes. Uh, ah, a statue? No. Would you want it that realistic? Or do you still want it to feel like it's... I mean, I lo- I'm okay with it after it's... Watching them build it is what's freaking me out here. Like watching them literally put the eyeballs into their empty ass eye sockets. <laughs> like, yeah, they put a ceramic eyeball in uh, and they put in, I think, real hairs. And then they also have some set of dentures they stick in there. Yeah, this one looks a little faker. The, the Henry Cavill Superman. I think it's the outfit, the texture you can kind of spot. It looks mm. more like a like a figure. But if you showed me a, an image of the of the Joaquin Phoenix Joker or the Margot Robbie Harley Quinn, those I wouldn't be able to tell those are figures. But, yeah, this is uh, kind of like the next stage of evolution of statue and, like, action figure collecting. I mean, I remember when Todd McFarlane was on the show, he mentioned about like the task of just redoing the entire toy market. When he was in the early years of Spawn wanting to bring out a new line of action figures, the one request he had was like, damn it, I want this to look like the characters. Like it seems like it's such a silly thing, but put a little damn effort into the line work, into the into the the paint, you know, the structure, like put a little thought into it. And that's actually why McFarlane Toys, I think, found so much success. And also it's proven because of the IPs that were acquired along the way because these studios are like, just give it to McFarlane. He's making them look like they are on the screen. But what I'm looking at here, it literally, like I could actually be yeah. fooled with some of the finals that like, if you just took a picture of it, I go, yeah, that's, that's Joaquin Phoenix. That's some giant is touching his face with an enormous <laughs> finger. And like, now I'm a little concerned, like, what are you going to do when you take those teeth out? Right. You could take the teeth out and who knows what's going to happen with these action figures. Yeah. They're not action <laughs> figures, I guess, but like, I'm worried you could get a little too creative with this stuff. Well, I went down a rabbit hole with this a little bit. Okay. So I'm just trying to like, trying to get, understand it more. How long has it been around for the process? And it seems like there's the the versions that they create to promote, and they're not the only ones. There's another one. I think it's called Queen something. We'll figure out the name through this bit. They don't all look the same or as great because I think each one is so individually hand done. They're not mass processed. So I think there's a little bit of variety to them, but not always in a great way. I think there's a little more upkeep because it's silicone. And I also believe um, the prices are pretty high on these things. Oh, man. I'm, so yeah. it's like, I don't know. I think you might be paying for one statue versus maybe buying three statues potentially. So it's just a difference. But they do come in really large sizes as well. So I don't know. It's an interesting thing. Right, right. You're like, <laughs> silicone market. Where uh, else is that I useful? was just going to say, yo, Margot Robbie, <laughs> even if that's right? a doll, she looking pretty fine, comic <laughs> fan, from, from this angle. I want to know your thoughts in the comment section about this because there's a part of me that's – I don't care for this. I feel like it's like you might as well just get a freaking cardboard – cut out of a character that's life size and pay 80 bucks or whatever it costs for one of those things, you know, but also I don't have the same interest in statue collecting as, as other homies of ours. However, I will say if you've ever seen like the alien and predator statues, they have like a whole line of like the, you know, the, the AVP types of stuff that looks so damn cool, and they're giant. They're huge, you know? Like, I, Imagine waking up in the middle of the night, going to the bathroom, and walking down the hallway, and you got this freaky AVP monster in the hallway, and you got your lights aren't on, and you forget you got a statue in there, or like even one of these life-size you know, Jokers or Harley Quinns or something. It's like, it's too real. There's like, are you a, a, a figure, or are you some kind of you know, ensorcelled miniature of, an, of a creature that's going to wake up in the middle of the night and pluck out my eyeballs you know I, I don't i don't trust it i don't like it are you huffing my breath at night just to <laughs> just <laughs> capture my soul all right comic fam let us know because it is creepy i'm glad you waited to get our to gauge our reaction because i don't know if i care for this it's not my thing but i can also imagine maybe the right character it's probably like ten thousand dollars too so like it's definitely not my thing i think it's not that i think it's like 3k i've seen three thousand dollars for you know, this 1500 3000 i got bills on, i got bills yeah, man. depending on the size oh, you know so yeah and i think it's i don't know i don't know how many they make um but i do like i said i've heard i've seen that they don't look as good as the display that they have sometimes so you're like, oh, I just spent three thousand on a broke ass Margo. It kind of looks like like a yeah. like a wax museum yeah, type like, of attempt. It's, it's like Harbo Marley, or <laughs> <laughs> like when you get a like a Whopper and it's like this doesn't look like the sign. This that thing was beautiful. This is some kind of high school cafeteria slop. 
Real quick on the Whopper, though. I had that Spider-Verse Spider -verse Whopper burger. It was so good. It was so good. I saw you on Instagram reviewing that. You got to follow these guys on Instagram, Comic Fam, Golden Age Guru, and Fire Guy, Ryan. We also made a Crash Down Comic IG. It's transition. Ooh. That was good. Okay. So we chatted last week about the CBCS Magazine case. Very cool. Very excited. Um, there was a lot of pros to it. Um, a better case, a more tight label so that it's actually flush with the case. That was my favorite part of it. It actually upped the overall look of the slab because it was cut so perfectly. And then I don't know what happened. Maybe someone at CGC saw the show or maybe just Jeff is rubbing up against the right elbows. But you're holding a magazine case from CGC. You got to break that damn thing open. I'm so excited to see this because right. CGC – also redid their magazine case. They're hearing the cries of the comic fan. This is where the comic health insurance comes into play. This is the same knife. Yeah, waving yeah. that around. <laughs> yeah, dude. You cut yourself? We're, we're blood brothers, dude. <laughs> Inc first incision. Here we go. All right. Shout out to CGC. Thanks for sending this out as an example so that we can review it. That we got to come up with a, a thing to do when we like are opening boxes, like the box dance, box unboxing dance. What do you think? Because like we have to have some B roll for this because he's just he's doing his thing. What's the first thing that comes to mind when like dancing, Ryan? Do you dance? Do you don't know that? I don't think you, I've ever seen you dance. I have a tap dance class every Thursday night. <laughs> Jazz. How do, you haven't asked me about this? I, I've been tap dancing out in the living room all the time, and Tom doesn't address it at all. And I'm like, I'm so surprised because the people below us, I, I feel like they would get upset with Ryan tap dancing. I'm a pretty big dude, but they don't. They probably hear how cool it sounds, and they're like, "That sounds good." I'm Ryan is it. a little bigger than me. Correct, and a much better tap dance. Take a look at this picture we took from the into across the Spider Verse uh, voyage we went on. Oh yeah, it's beautiful. Oh, it's amazing. Okay, here we go. So they sent you two. Did they? Okay, did CGC go, oh, CBC has sent them two. We're going to send them one. Or wait, are they not it? Oh, no, they're not it. <laughs> Is it not it? No. <laughs> oh, no. Blooper. Are you serious? Yes. I don't know why they sent me these two books. This, I mean, I submitted these books, but aren't in, a much, in a much bigger order. So I thought these were the magazines. Okay, well, new plan, comic fan. We Hit gotta the subscribe. unbox whatever this is now. After all that. All right, I want to know what Jeff is unboxing because it's not what we thought it would be. Oh, and it's Dark Hawk number one at a nine point eight. <laughs> and a nine point six Dark Hawk. <laughs> we just got Dark Hawk, comic fam. It's officially happened. Oh uh, shoot! I was afraid of this. I should kind of I was like, should I open it? It's like, now nah, be better on camera. Dude, all of the books that that could have been. <laughs> and it was a Dark Hawk number one. Shout out right. Swagahoss. Oh, my gosh. What is happening today, Comic <laughs> Fam? Okay, well, we're going to have to uh, come back to the table. You know, we record this as close to live as possible for you, and this is the real real. We over here thought we had magazine holders, and we don't have them. Is CGC sending us magazine holders, or you just made that up? They told me they were going to send some magazine holders. Okay, well, what I'm looking at are two Dark Hawk 1s, and they're 9.8s, and woo, okay, cool. <laughs> All right, well. 196. We're going to get some freaking dope-ass shots. You're, this guy's going to be trying to leave. We're going to be like, no, 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 dude. we got to take shots of that Dark Hawk 1 and show it <laughs> this just in became all of its the glory. the theme of the whole show now. It's all, it all going to be about this unboxing. So it's, it's exciting. The whole thing has changed. Okay. Well. Now what? Now what? Where well, they we got to go hit the now? damn subscribe button, comic fam. Because one of these days we will have the magazine unboxing holder. So hit that like, hit that subscribe. All right. Well, we have a friend, a good friend. His name is Dinesh Shadassay. What's his name? Dinesh Shadassani. That's how I say his name. In person, too. Be like, oh, Dinesh Shadassani. <laughs> this dude is really cool. Um, very smart man. Um, great heart and a wealth of knowledge about comic books. And is single-handedly, like, bettering the industry every single day. And I don't think he gets enough credit for it. Bad Idea Comics is one of the best independent companies to emerge out of comic books in over a decade. You know, um, everything they do creates a splash. It's getting people into reading comics. It's getting people to go into LCSs like I've never seen. Um, this is a gentleman who knows a lot about comic books. His original art collection alone is something that you can't even accurately describe in a video. You know, pretty much every major cover that you would love to know if it exists still. You know, did Marvel throw it out? It's likely he owns it, you know? One of the conversations we had on the camera a year ago, he just whipped out an ASM 300 original cover. The cover 
like Todd McFarlane. So over a million dollar cover, right? Um, and he recently went on a show and chatted about comic books. Mainstream. And I want to discuss that today. I love me, Dinesh. Dinesh is a great dude. If you don't know him and you only know him through Bad Idea, and I know Bad Idea gets a lot of grief. I know they do. Outside of that, he's an amazing dude. He understands the hobby, too, of just, like, collecting on that deeper end. And like you said, I watched this this video with 2 Chains um, over on Vice. And I think you watch it on YouTube right now, GQ. Is that what it was called? Yeah, GQ posted a clip of it, and it's called Vice's Most Expensive. And this is where 2 Chains, the, the host, just gets, like, introduced to somebody who deals with something expensive, right? And I've seen him review things like marijuana. I've seen him review things like bottled water and like expensive water and ice, you know, jewelry, for example, cigars, and recently, courtesy of Dinesh, expensive paper, funny books, comic books. Yeah, and, and it definitely threw two chains for a loop, to be honest, because, I mean, just seeing the value of some of those books and not knowing that they can carry those top of dollar signs. And again, you, you have Dinesh, who has only not just expensive stuff, but also extremely rare. Now, rare and expensive don't always go hand in hand. But for the stuff that he bought, in brought, this case, it does. It it, it did. It did because I believe he had a funny picture stories as motion well. Motion picture motion funnies. Pi- yeah, motion picture funnies, uh, which is the first appearance of Submariner, which would be reprinted in Marvel Comics number one, and it came out as a gift for theaters back in the '30s. So most of them were thrown away. Very few exist, and he's like sitting there at a on a couch showing it to two chains. Like you said, it's practically a ghost. Um, It's definitely extremely coveted. And again, if you ever want to read Submariner's origin, I mean, that dude was a son of a bitch when he started, man. (laughs) He was a jerk, dude. You got to check him out. Stray Stone Cold Killer. Um, But anyway, it was an amazing – it's always a treat to see it. So to see it get public attention, anytime our hobby can get some positive public attention of where it's going and it's – financial vitality really is, uh, I think, really important for us all in this hobby. Did you see the TMNT number one printer's proof? Apparently, there's only two of these that were made. And I've actually talked to him about this in depth because he acquired it over a year ago. And I thought he actually sold it. So it was really cool to see that he didn't sell it. And he's sitting there with two chains showing him this. Like, you can clearly tell that he was the one who made the decision, and I'm excited to talk to him about this in person. Hit the subscribe button. Um, but I assume that that's something that he either suggested or just insisted. Like, this is something we should talk about. Because at first glance, it doesn't look like a special book. Like, the cover isn't of TMNT1. It's it's like just a blank piece of white paper that looks kind of trash. And then the insides, the innards, are, are TMNT1. So this printer's proof was used. I mean, again, this is an independent comic. Early on, we're talking about stinking mutated turtles having a comic book. So do you, I mean, like, pitching that idea, just think about it, just sounds like idiotic isn't going to work. They were in their garage, yo. Like, they were just finding a printer to print their book, you know. Yeah, so now they have this proof. Uh, proof of concept to bring to print, and that's basically what this was used. I mean, this is basically the birth of the turtles here on these pages before it actually entered into pages that you guys would be able to buy on the newsstands. But Dinesh had it. But Dinesh had it. And 2 Chains was, like, so excited to see it. He was super stoned, which makes the show very funny. But I think there was an... I've seen a couple of these episodes before, and there was a clear difference in how he was absorbing the information of these comics, partially because a lot of the other episodes of this, you see a reaction from him that's kind of like, that's $100,000, that's $50,000. And it seems like an authentic reaction in that, wow, why would someone pay that much money for a cigar or something, you know, insert whatever expensive item there was. But when Dinesh is showing 2 Chains the first appearance of Spider-Man and he's finding out that this book is worth X amount, There wasn't the same type of disbelief, even though there was a little bit of surprise. But you can tell that the comics, there's you're holding artwork here. I don't know. I got a different vibe. It's the historical aspect. You know, it's not just an expensive, rare, valuable thing, but it's everybody knows Spider Man. You know, like everyone has an attachment to either the movies or the cartoons or, you know, even Two Chains knows what that is versus, yeah, this is the world's most expensive bottled water. Like, that's cool. (laughs) <laughs> you know, no one's made a billion dollar franchise out of that, but something about something like Spider-Man or TMNT and like getting to see 
the roots and the beginning of it, stuff that people don't normally have. That makes it pretty special. And, yeah, it definitely looks like 2 Chains was high as hell during that video. He's having fun. I mean, I, I, I can't blame him. That'd be, that'd be fun to be in his shoes and get all that expensive stuff thrown at you. You probably could have sold him a giant size uh, Swamp Thing number one for $80,000. Well, here we go, though. Because it didn't just stop there. Of course, Dinesh broke out the goods, right? He, he had the TMNT prototype. He had the AF-15s. He had Cap-1, a gorgeous Cap-1. And he, he's riffing about World War II. Like, you know, Dinesh is full of knowledge. And I thought it was really cool to see a different take, you know, with 2 chains talking about, like, just pure Americana. Not just, like, expensive materials, right? Or, or items, rather. He also brought out, because he's Dinesh and he's awesome, one of the bad idea invisible comic books. And as soon as I saw that, I started freaking laughing. Like this guy thought, oh, I got to break out my freaking bad idea invisible comic book and show two chains. And he's sitting there explaining how this is a comic book that is invisible. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we have created invisibility. And two chains is like, now it was kind of a reaction like the other videos. He's going, oh, come on. Like, what? what is this? So I thought it worth mentioning that, you know, the kudos that he did that. But also, let's pull up the invisible comic book on GPA and see how it's performed. And Jeff, you still have your 10.0. And for those of you who don't know, can you run them through? Give them a rundown, a gym rundown, Charles vibes about what the invisible comic book is. Okay. First off, just before we go down there, that path, I can only imagine being high, not knowing anything about comics and someone presenting to you an invisible comic to your face and being like, this is the invisible comic. <laughs> like, could you just imagine? I smoked the good stuff today. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> it is invisible. <laughs> okay, so the invisible comic was some, it's called Conceptual Funnies Number 1. It's basically a promotional book. I mean, promotional books have been around a long time. So, Bad Idea put out, I don't know how many of these, but there 34. are- 34 slabs exist 34 slabs exist multiple copies in certain grades i believe in 99 there's only one and in Nintendo, there's only one all of them have just one copy except the 98 in which there are 11 okay so with that said when i first heard about this we were all at a restaurant in front of a and just kind of joking and drinking all day and dinesh did some kind of like gotcha journalism and I it was all for it. He tells me, yo, I want to show you something. Can we get together after Emerald City? This has got to be two years ago. And I get there, and all the homies are all drinking. They're all having a good time. And they're like, Tom, you got to see this. Dinesh, show him, show him. And he whips out this right here. It was a 9-8 copy, not this 10.0. And I'm laughing at it. Everybody's just laughing. And then someone goes, you know, shout out. Who was it? Was it Yan? Yanif was there. Yanif was there. He's yeah. the one who's like, you know what? I'm going to buy this right now. Shout out Stray Flex. And he pulls out $1,000 cash. He's like, I'm going to buy it right now. He starts whipping out $100 bills. And I saw the reaction of all the dealers. And at that point, I went from going, oh, this is so silly. I can't believe CGC graded this. But then also, I can't believe it that Dinesh made this happen. Wait a minute. I can believe it. It's called Conceptual Funnies. It's the Invisible Edition. And it's literally just acetate, just just plastic, with two staples and nothing on the inside. So I got this presented to me, and I took a picture of it with all the homies, not really thinking anything about it. You know, I thought it was fun. And I'm like, yo, dude, it'd be cool. I want to cover this. And he's like, yo, dude, I'll give you one. We have a lot of them. And I'm like, no, no, no. I don't want to. If I'm going to get one, I'm going to buy it just like anyone else. However... If you give me one, I will give it away on the show, which we did, by the way. Now, what is hilarious is that soon after this whole meeting, Bleeding Cool does an entire blog post, an article about how influencer comic Tom is seen with the very first invisible comic book courtesy of Bad Idea. And yo, I got so many people crapping on me. And I'm over here going like, I was just there. I, I didn't realize I was taking the first picture of it. But Jeff, you had a very, very good idea as the commotion's happening. As you're watching someone buy one of the 11 9.8s for $1,000, we found out that he graded multiple copies. He had a 1.0, you know, a 2.0. I think pretty much everything but except a 1.8 is on the census. And let me just, yep, no, oh, yeah, there's no 1.8s on the census, but every other grade point, including a 0.5, there is a copy that exists. So I'm over here going, hey, I'm going to take a 9.8 to just 
giveaway on the show. He will mail it to me eventually. And then some people are like, oh, well, is there, is there a 0. 0.5? I want the 0. 0.5. Oh, there's a 1.0. I want the low-grade copy. And Jeff, you had the best question. Is there a 10.0? And he said, oh, there is a 10.0. And Jeff goes, I call it. Yeah. And you called it, and you got it, and everybody there was like, I should have asked about the 10.0, <laughs> damn it. Yes, dude. I was like, I'm sitting there, and everyone's talking about like a, a no-grade or 0. 0.5. I was like, wait, everything's the same price? As a 10.0, there's only one. I was like, uh, is there a 10.0, Dinesh? And he's like, yes. Uh, and I was like, I want it. That's like, the one done. you want. And he was like, done. I was like, there you go, man. Here's the money I sent to money later. Uh, and he sent me the book. And, you know, like, I was like, how do you not spend $1,000 for any 10.0 of anything in this market at all anymore? Like, a, an opportunity to get a 10.0. Like, again, this is a promotional thing. These grades were just put on there, you know, but I do have the loan one that is a 10.0 and again i mean this is the most valuable book i probably own guys <laughs> so if you really want to rip it out of my hands you know you got a new yeah, website we got to talk about numbers right now so ryan would looked up some numbers yeah ryan hit us with it because there's only been a few copies and what i remember is when this was initially released to the public the way bad idea did it is he had to sign up to their newsletter and submit an offer and they went through the top offers and created the path forward on this. So what immediately happened was people offered $3,000, $2,500 for a lot of these books. Some that for t two grand. I, I heard some $1,500 sales, right? Is that what these sales are? No, these sales are in the aftermarket post all the members getting them. So the members got them and then they sold them and now we have GPA numbers. It so looks, Ryan, it start looks like most of these people got them and are hanging on to them because there are only four sales publicly on GPA of this book across all grades. Okay, so let's go through and let's actually do it in order of which they were sold. So we're looking chronologically. At, so the, the first, first sale one, is March 2002. The 3.5 sold for $2,200. That's the only sale. The next one would be August for an 8.0. Right. A few months later in August, that is the lowest the lowest sale on here. $1,000 for the highest grade so that's sold. So yeah, these things are kind of all over the board. Then the next one, which is actually just a little bit before August, it happened one month prior, a 3.0 for $2,500 sold July 2022. But there also is a sale in 2023. This would be the most recent sale, um, which was just this last May, and it went for $1,199 and a 1.0. So I don't know. That 8.0 seems more like an anomaly than anything else. So whoever got that, kudos, by the way. Um, so... But yeah, I mean, these books are out there. They'll pop up occasionally. Someone will let it go. And uh, I don't know, man. What do you guys think? I just had an interesting idea. So give me a second. Who are you calling? One second. Ch two chains? Hi. Here, Russ, I'm putting on speaker. We're recording a podcast. I'm going to put you in it. <laughs> Russ. Okay. Hey, can, you hear, can, can, we hear, um, can you hear us okay? Uh, I can hear you fine. Okay. So I just thought of something. Russ, we're going through the invisible funnies. Didn't you own the 1.0? I did. I did, I did actually own the, the conceptual funnies 1.0. Yep. So we're looking at a sale May 2023 on GPA for eleven ninety nine. Is that your sale? Yes, that's my oh. <laughs> It just hit me that that may be yours, Russ. Oh, wow. Good call. Yep. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, uh, I've been... Uh, emailing with five or six different people on eBay who were all interested. And uh, I just got to the point where, uh, you know what, we just needed to get uh, rid of a few things. I loved having it. It has a great story. I love the fact that we were able to do um, a nice video about it with you and me and Jeff. But I figured I might as well pass it on to the comic fam and someone really wanted it. So I'm super happy I got what I got for it. And uh, yeah, someone else owns it now. Yo, thank you, Russ. I appreciate you, brother. Keep getting well. Take care, bud. All right. Take it easy, guys. Bye-bye. How funny is that? I'm sitting here going, I thought he got the point five, but then I remember he didn't get the point five. Someone else got that, so he got the 1.0. So I forgot about that. Who would have thought that that was actually Mill Geek Comics? Follow him on Instagram. Comic fam, we've gone through so much stuff. Jeff messed up the entire show with one of the bits. So I need you to hit the like button, to hit the subscribe button. And damn it, as always. That was fun. Geek responsibly. Enough? Set. I've done too many outros. I'm just gonna have Ben do it. This is Ben Temple Smith, living horror legend.
I'm drawing the book of Crash Town. Whatnot's first real horror comic, and it's coming soon uh, from this beautiful man right here and me. Thanks for watching the video. Thanks for ordering Crash Town or about to order it right now, right? Peace. Peace. See you guys. We love you.